Hello, everybody. I am hopefully live. Today is Thursday, that much I know. The date, I cannot exactly tell you, but uh, I'm sure 23rd, the 23rd possibly. Wait, I have to check if I'm right. I'm a little bit behind on these things as we go. Yeah, Thursday the 23rd. Proud of myself with that one. Uh, how you doing? Things in Krakow continue to be uh, under lockdown. The world is uh, still the world that we have come to know. I'm just looking at some technical stuff exiting full screen. So I'll be able to see the both things at once, the Facebook and the Zoom. It's a little complicated today technically, but happy that this is up and working. Hi, Zach. Hi, Sue Ellen. See, we we're starting to see. It just takes me a minute to get. So I see the Zoom and the chat. There we go. As I said last week, Zoom and Facebook are at different times. So if you watch yourself on the, if you see your face in the Facebook, it's like 30 seconds behind. So you go a little bit crazy. Rabbi Avi from Israel, Saul. Schachter. Hey, Saul. How you doing? From cold New York. Shishek. Shishek Shatrovsky from Olsten. Jeffrey Rolat from sunny LA. All right. Everyone checking in. We have our regulars checking in. Good to see everybody. Kasha Leonardi, a regular. Kasha, very nice to see you in this uh, way. I will see you at home. Uh, let's, get, let's get to it. Um, Poland has started actually to um, loosen some of the regulations. Actually, they opened, which was uh, our dog, uh, Hanya, our killer dog, was very uh, excited to hear that they've opened parks and forests, which means we can now take the dog down to the river, which is a nice, uh, nice thing for the dog. They've also uh, started to loosen the regulations with shops. Some clothing shops are, are, are open, uh, which is uh, sort of good that the economy going, of course, you know, with the uh, all the social distancing and people here, it's obligatory to wear a mask and uh, a mask in public. So everybody has to keep their face uh, covered, which is good. Hi, Vicki Warner, Frank London. Oh, Klezmer God, Frank London. Trumpeter extraordinaire from the Lower East Side. How you doing, Frank? Linda from Rockland County. Oh, everyone's checking in. Hey, everybody. A lot of people that are really close to, close to my heart and close to Krakow. Uh, Checking in, it's nice to see. Uh, so here, so yeah, so regulations are starting a little bit to open things up. And again, we don't have, I think, you know, all of this craziness going on in the United States with the different states versus the insane president and dealing with the political aspect. Here, you're not really finding that so much. Uh, people are generally all on board with the way things have been going. I think that there's more or less support for the pace of closing and opening things. The only real issue here that people are worried about is the uh, election. We're supposed to have elections in Poland in like two weeks and there's a big, uh, big fight uh, brewing about that, whether it's safe to have the elections, whether there can be postal elections. So a lot of these issues, which are complicated issues and uh, we'll see, we'll see what goes on with that. But it's not uh, all the issues around Corona, the way that the government is dealing with Corona. I think even many of us that don't uh, like a lot of things the government has done uh, in the past is uh, is doing a good job. I think keeping the country uh, pretty safe. The numbers here, just to give you a bit of a, uh, so you can compare it to wherever you are. Mostly people in the U.S., but not only. Uh, is we have ten thousand three hundred and forty six infected with Corona. Four hundred and thirty five people have have passed away, and seven hundred seventeen hundred and forty have recovered. Uh, so considering that's 38, 38 million is the population, just to get a to get an idea of it. So we're about a little less than 10 percent, maybe uh, maybe we're 12 percent of the population of the United States. And the, those are our numbers: 10,000 infected, 435, uh, 435 dead. So I think we're still seeing the fact that countries like Poland that that got ahead of this early uh, are doing better. Of course, now there's some talk about what what methods, what's the methodology for, for discussing, for uh, reporting deaths and cases of corona. 
that if people in some countries, if people have an underlying illness, if people have cancer and then get corona, they don't count it as a corona death, which I think is being a little bit disingenuous. But uh, yeah, with these are things that we'll have to work out once once this is all done. I think the focus needs to be now and hopefully is wherever you are on getting everything, getting everything going, uh, getting every, keeping everybody safe, getting corona, getting us past corona and then getting the country, countries, world up and moving again. Uh, in terms of us here at the JCC, things are still closed. Everyone's still working at home, um, doing a little bit of renovation on the building, but just about everybody, we have 37 full-time employees. Everybody is uh, working from home. The programming team is busy trying to keep everything up, uh, up and going online. A lot of our things have moved online. Still, as I mentioned before, priority taking care of our seniors. We're delivering uh, groceries to our seniors and medicine, taking care of them, calling them every day, uh, and really is a, continues to be a main, main priority for what we're doing with our seniors. I can say that I've spoken to a bunch of them, generally in good spirits. They're ready to come back. Uh, they're not so worried, to be honest. I guess you, you've survived the Holocaust and you've lived through 50 years of communism in Poland. I guess Corona doesn't scare you too much. So the seniors are raring to come back to the institution. Uh, but of course, we're going to stay closed until that needs, uh, until we're allowed to be open and until it's safe to be open. So the government has announced three more steps for us. Uh, we're in step one was opening the forests, opening the uh, parks, starting a little bit with shops. There were two, three and four are the, are the three stages until we're finally open. Stage two will be hotels with certain restrictions. Uh, home improvement stores, and then for us, which is important, some cultural institutions, libraries, museums, and art galleries. That's stage two, which is the next stage. I'm hoping, you know, it's not clear, they didn't give us all the details. I'm hoping, we think that stage two would include us. Stage three is hairdressers, shopping malls, restaurants with restrictions, certain sporting events with up to 50 people, and preschools with certain restrictions, and then stage four, beauty salons, gym and fitness, and then theaters and cinemas with new hygienic uh, restrictions. So that's, that's where we are today in Poland. Um, government uh, still you know, very much on top of this, and, but it's nice, I think there's at least a feeling, I'm not sure if the feeling is right or wrong, but there's a feeling in Poland that we've started to turn the corner on this, that uh, we're not completely overwhelmed. The hospitals haven't been, they're working hard, our first line, protectors, the ho hospital workers and all the healthcare workers are doing an amazing job. And I think the hospitals haven't been, haven't been overrun, which is something uh, fantastic. For me personally, just uh, get to spend a lot of time at home with Kasha, which is something that doesn't happen that often. Get to spend a lot of time in Krakow, which is something that doesn't happen very often. I I've gotten to know the city much, much better than I, uh, than I ever have. I've been speaking with a lot of friends from the past. Really, we've done a good job. My friends from my Opan, as, uh, as a lot of you guys know, I did an Ulpan in Israel 25 years ago on Kibbutz Yot Bata, a beautiful, beautiful kibbutz near Eilat in the desert. And a bunch of us have stayed in touch. And now with Corona going on, we have a little bit more free time. So we're doing, uh, doing uh, WhatsApp groups and, uh, and things like that. So being able to see some friends that I haven't seen in a, in a long time. In terms of watching, watching things, I still haven't had the attention span to read, which is something that I think when I look back on Corona, I'm going to regret having some more free time and not reading at all. I'm usually, you know, quite a reader, but I keep with work keeps me so busy. It's hard for me to read as much as I would like to. When I go on vacation anywhere, I just want to sit there and do nothing but but read in the sun. But uh, with with this extra time and being at home, I haven't. I guess just all the news that's going on and the changes and having to deal with the whole institution that's dealing with Corona. I haven't bunch of books on my on my nightstand, and I haven't been reading at all. So I have had the attention span to watch uh, some TV. We talked in the past about uh, Tiger King and we talked about Unorthodox. Um, I finished Ozark, which was good, and just finished Fauda. Jeffrey Rollat, I know, was on, who is the uh, number one fan of Fauda. I have to say, I don't want to give any spoilers. No spoilers, don't worry if you haven't done it, but I will say only one thing about Fauda. Season three is phenomenal phenomenal really i think just about the best action show the best action show going uh hi benji love it your fata the crack out of the arava exactly so benji exactly exactly so 
And the JCC is what? The Shoko is the Shoko of Yod Pata. Pastor Gill, good morning to you, Pastor Gill. Pastor Gill is an amazing, amazing community leader in, uh, in, in Brooklyn, who's doing just an amazing job there, especially uh, de- doing from our part, from, you know, doing an amazing job in the African-American community in Brooklyn and really working hard, bridging the gaps between the African-American community and the Jewish community, done a lot of amazing, amazing work. Came out here before, uh, came out here last year with uh, ADL, our friends from ADL, came out with Evan Bernstein and uh, had an amazing visit, went to Auschwitz and we're working on a bunch of stuff that once this all clears up, uh, then uh, Pastor Gill, I'm sure will be out here again and we'll be able to continue doing, uh, doing good work. Jeffrey mentioned, Jeffrey Rolat mentioned uh, best season ever. Yes, Jeffrey, we did discuss it yesterday. Hi, hello, Alon from uh, where are you calling from? Alon from Tel Aviv, Alon Goldman, the co chair of the uh, World Chenstahova Association. Alon mentions Yotvata, best Shoko in Israel. Alon, I'm going to have to correct you. Yotvata is not the best Shoko in Israel, it's the best Shoko in the world. Yotvata. Certainly the Shako that I didn't uh, get my hands into is even better. Now, I think last time I saw they have sh- Shako with less sugar, which is something very, very important. Uh, Yod Pata, always staying ahead, trying to keep healthy. Uh, place very, very close to my heart. Benji Lovett asks very important question. Do they bring back Mr. Furley? for season three. No, I think they're gonna go with the Ropers. Actually, I think that uh, Stanley and Helen Roper will be joining uh, Fauda season four. I don't wanna give anything away, but uh, Mr. Furley was a little less popular. The Ropers, I think are gonna be the, the host. Uh, I think Daron is gonna live in an apartment that owned by the Ropers. So doing a little bit of a cross pollination. The obvious connection, when I watch Fauda, I, of course, as many of you do, as, as, uh, as uh, Benji does, I think also of Three's Company. So what better thing to connect Fauda and Three's Company? I'm sure Benji should get started on the screenplay. Mark Baranek, the king of Miami Beach. How are you, Mark? Very good to see you. Uh, so we finished, so I mentioned finished Fauda and started watching the Michael, doc, Michael Jordan documentary, which so far has been pretty interesting. We watched the first two episodes as a Tar Heel and as somebody who's a huge, huge NBA fan. I am uh, excited to watch, very, very excited to watch uh, the Michael Jordan uh, thing. Happy they pushed that forward. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I have high hopes for it. Uh, many of you are starving for sports. I think one of the things that's, you know, you're stuck at home, you think, oh, if I'm stuck at home, and at least you can watch sports. But no sports, nothing to watch. So many of us are looking, uh, watching old documentaries, old games and things. So the Michael Jordan uh, special on S- on ESPN, uh, something that really hits hits the mark and comes right on time. So I have some questions. I have some questions before we get to our guest star, our guest star, Krakowian, uh, Krakowian uh, born, Krakowian bred, Agnieszka Gish. Some of you know from the Ride for the Living and from the JCC and just being an amazing, amazing part of our JCC family here. Uh, also from the gaming community from the uh, uh, nerdy underside of Krakow. Gish has a lot of fans there as well. So we're gonna get to Agnieszka in a few minutes. Uh, I just wanna answer some of our questions. Did the JCC do anything for Yom HaShoah? Yes, we did. Yom HaShoah was a couple of days ago. We generally, uh, our policy here when you're in Krakow and you're an hour's drive from Auschwitz, then you don't take one day like Yom HaShoah or two days Yom HaShoah and International uh, Holocaust Day in January and think about the Holocaust. We're dealing with the Holocaust and thinking about the Holocaust every single day with the 50 survivors that, we're, uh, that we have here as members that we're taking care of and just dealing with all visitors uh, and groups who come here having gone to Auschwitz, about to go to Auschwitz. So for us, Holocaust, Holocaust Day is really every day. So I think that for us, we don't need to really commemorate because we're constantly commemorating here at the JCC in Krakow. So what we do is really generally light candles. We have uh, the the victims in our hearts and we go about rebuilding Jewish life, which I think is just about the the best way to honor the survivors and to honor the victims is in their name and with them in our hearts and our minds, 
rebuild Jewish life in the, in the place that they came from in honor of them and the families and all that were lost. So that's, uh, that's, that's how we celebrated Yom HaShoah. I, I also personally, I did, a, uh, I did a Zoom call with uh, Temple Emmanuel of Kloster, that's Rabbi, Rabbi Kirshner, uh, organization that's very, very close to us here at the JCC. They actually bought us a van that we use to deliver, deliver uh, food to the, to the survivors. So it was very fitting that I could thank the community over the, in person, but in Zoom, on Yom HaShoah for helping us do that. Uh, another question, next week is JCC's 12th birthday. Do you have any cool memories from the opening? I have many, many cool memories from the opening. Uh, I'll just tell you one story. Um, I guess most people know that the JCC was opened by Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales. Uh, that's it, so he came on a visit and uh, early, years earlier, and they came up with this idea of doing something for the survivors, which became a larger idea. And through the help of World Jewish Relief and the JDC and the local community here, we we're able to build the JCC. So I came aboard a couple months before. I had no idea. I was essentially came from being a lifeguard on the kibbutz to teaching here at the university to uh, suddenly I'm the director of the JCC. Prince Charles is coming. We have no staff at all. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I practiced and thought about what to say when I finally meet Prince Charles and welcoming him to, into the empty building that would become the Prince of Wales Jewish Community Center. And I go to uh, stand outside in front of the, I'm standing at the door and Prince Charles comes walking in, you know, seen him on TV and that, you know, all, all in the media all the time. And I'm about to say something to Prince Charles. I open my mouth and he goes, oh, you must be Jonathan. I've heard so much about you, what a pleasure to meet you. And then after that, and my jaw just hit the ground, Prince Charles was honored to meet me. Uh, I, I couldn't believe it that he, that he said that. I guess he'd obviously been well prepared. Uh, he gets well briefed before these meetings and I was so starstruck. I don't think I said another word to him the, ne the rest of the day. Afterwards, I did have an opportunity uh, years later to meet with him again, talk about the JCC and, uh, and I reminded him of, of what he said and that I think I said, I, I apologize if I didn't give you much of a tour, but I was so starstruck that I don't think I said anything to you uh, since uh, the, the first day when you came to visit. But uh, that was one of the memories I have uh, from the opening, but there were many, many, open, many memories. And soon, next week we'll post, I always post a video of Prince Charles's speech that somebody took uh, that we have from his opening speech standing in front of the building. Um, maybe just get to a couple more questions uh, that people sent in and then we're gonna get to Agnes Gagish. How's the sign collection going? Sign collection going very well. As always, I will mention if any of you have any spare street signs or are able to uh, legally obtain any street signs, see something fell down, maybe there was a storm on your block, maybe you're walking down the street with some tools and somebody, a street sign that looks like it uh, needs a home, then please, please uh, pick one up and bring it. Jared, Jared the Court, JCC Bar Mitzvah next year. Actually, this year was supposed to be our Bat Mitzvah. So we'll celebrate our bar, bat mitzvah virtually, and then next year we'll have a big bar mitzvah. Jared, I think you and some of the Lacourts have never been to Krakow. We'd love to have you visit Doc, Dr. Jared Lacourt from uh, downtown New York by way of Hewlett. Uh, if you need, by the way, a little plug, if any of you need a good cardiologist on Staten Island, Jared Lacourt is your man. So the sign collection is going well, but please, I'm waiting for uh, any of your signs. Are you doing speeches with different communities online? How can we arrange that? Yes, uh, I've done a bunch of uh, things like this. I talk about the JCC and Poland and the rebirth of Jewish life. I've been to many of your communities and we're also a doing that online. So if anybody wants any, any uh, content, I'm happy to come and speak to your community. I come uh, speak to your community by Zoom and, do, and uh, do that so you can be in touch with us or very, very excited to uh, always to do that. I always want to get the word out. Um, so now I'm going to uh, introduce my guest, somebody who's very, very close to me. Somebody who's an amazing, really one of the most remarkable people I've ever met. I met her a long time ago. She was very, very young uh, and just blew me away straight away that she was this young person with such presence. I met her when she was 16. Uh, I like to joke and call her my evil protege, but she's not really She's not really evil at all, although I think she would like to be a little bit evil as we all would, but really a remarkable, remarkable young woman who is uh, really one of the main 
pillars of this institution and of Ride for the Living. And she's about to come on screen. So I am very, very happy, good timing, to introduce my guest, Agnieszka Gish. Hi, hello everyone. How are you today, Agnieszka Gish? I'm good. Actually, now that we can leave the apartment and the weather is nice, I feel like I'm going into more at ease mode. Uh, in comparison to the last you know, month being basically stuck at home. So I know for the last six weeks, you've just been sitting at home and not doing anything. How has that been, Agnieszka? Well, by not doing anything, it's also playing video games most of the time. And uh, actually I've picked up a lot of reading, so that's nice. Uh, and you know, we are all busy, still busy working, which is a really nice thing to have these days to keep you occupied. Um, so it's been actually pretty okay. So you'd like more work? Exactly. <laughs> Excellent. This is a very good thing. I'm noting this is a very good thing always to tell your boss that you want more work. Now, uh, Agnieszka, you are, tell us about your job at the JCC. So uh, my job at the JCC now, it's easy to explain in one sentence because it's right for the living coordinator. Um, and uh, I've been at the JC for nine, year, for nine years, and for these nine years, my job has been changing each year. But now I focus my work on organizing the bike ride, the annual bike ride that we do from Auschwitz to Krakow. So you mentioned you've been here for nine years. So maybe tell, tell us that story. How did you get to the JC? I was saying before you got on that you came here when you were 16. Yes. So maybe, how did you get to the JCC? Maybe, start, maybe we'll start with that. So I grew up in Kazimierz, uh, which is the Jewish district of Krakow, although my family is not Jewish. But uh, I think it's hard not to get interested in all things Jewish when you live in a place that has seven pre-war synagogues, that has the Jewish culture festival each year, and all these traces of Jewish life. Uh, but when I was growing up, there wasn't really any Jewish life present. There wasn't a Jewish community that I could see, that I could experience. So I was mostly learning from books and from going to museums, and I never really thought that I'll be able to experience Jewish life. And uh, when I was in high school, uh, my school organized uh, an exchange with a school in Israel, which is actually a very popular program among different schools in Poland. And we've met with um, youth from Israel, and the workshops uh, were led by a volunteer coordinator from the JCC, which she introduced herself and she said that, hi, I'm Agata, I'm from the Jewish Community Center in Krakow. And I was just so shocked that there's a place like this. And I knew that I have to come and see what it is. And the moment I walked through the door, I know that I'm going to sing in there. Uh, because just the really welcoming atmosphere and the place where I can, you know, see in life the things that I've read about uh, before. I see we have just, I uh, want to say a little shout out. We saw Michelle Romano. Hi, Michelle. Uh, love Michelle Romano uh, in Upper, Upper East Side, who uh, shout out to you and to Joe, who's recovering. I hope Joe's doing well. I heard he's doing, uh, doing much better. I'm really happy about that. Rabbi Avi says hi to you, Gish. So you have a lot hi, of, Rabbi you, have, Avi. You, have you have a lot of fans out there, Gish. <laughs> So you got to the JCC and you became a volunteer. And I say, now you're the Ride for Living coordinator. So what, have those, what different jobs have you had at the JCC? Uh, so I started out as a volunteer uh, and it, it, I was really spending every waking minute that I could uh, helping out at the reception and at the, uh, preparing the holidays, helping with programming and with, at the senior club. And I think after spending every minute there, you just sort of thought, well, we might as well hire her. She's here all the, all the time anyway. So that's when I started out uh, working in the programming department. So helping with different community events. Uh, when Rabbi Avi came to Krakow, I became his assistant for a year. Um, is, it true, is it true that you wanted to quit the JCC and leave Poland <laughs> when you became Rabbi Avi's assistant? Is that true? <laughs> Not true at all. <laughs> it was actually really fun experience because uh, me being a non-Jew, I, I knew a lot of things about Judaism, but I don't think such in-depth knowledge that I got when I was working with Avi. So I think that was a great learning experience. 
Um, and after that, uh, I've moved on a little bit to do a little bit of development work and fundraising. And uh, when we started setting up Friends of JC Krakow and when the first JVC Endpoint Fellow worked with us, Justin, this is when I moved into more into fundraising. And when the first ride happened, my actually my only job during the first ride was to buy toilet paper. So uh, it's I think it's really funny, you know, going from this to actually coordinating the event a few years later. Well, I think these days, to be honest, if somebody is good at can buy toilet paper in the United States, they can uh, they can really go very far considering the shortage. <laughs> Exactly, you know, now it comes in handy. Exactly, you know, with Rabbi Avi, no matter if, if Rabbi Avi ever gets upset and mad at me about anything, if we, I say, listen, I let you have Agnieszka Gish as your assistant for you. You can't complain about anything else. And he says, <laughs> good point. <laughs> Jeff Warshauer, Jeff Warshauer and Deborah Strauss, wow. We have really the creme de la creme. We had Frank London earlier now saying hi. So we really have the, Klez the Klezmer royalty uh, watching today. Hi, Jeff and Deborah. Uh, uh -huh. And tell a little bit about the ride. What's the biggest challenge I mean, besides this year with the ride with Corona and figuring out how that's going to happen? But generally speaking, what's the most uh, the biggest challenge organizing something like Ride for the Living? I think the biggest challenge is that it's just a lot of moving pieces uh, because we really do organize everything. So if a participant signs up, the only thing they need to do is fill out the registration form, get themselves to Krakow, and basically we take care of them for the rest of the time they're here. But uh, I think the strength that we have is really a great team that works on the right. We have uh, dedicated staff. We have uh, more than 30 volunteers each year that work just for the right. So, you know, with a team like this, it's actually a, a pleasure. And when you know that you can count on other people, it makes it really easier. I see. And, uh, you know, so, you know, with you, I have to tell you, Gish, that I think that we, you know, you've always, you've really been uh, an amazing employee, an amazing person. And since, since you started here, it, one of the things that's impressed me has been your desire to always improve yourself, a relentless desire to improve yourself. And you've had, I think, four internships at different, uh, different places, different Jewish institutions, really leading important Jewish institutions around the world. Can you talk to us a little bit about Maybe first, why you wanted to do why you know each summer for four years uh, you you did those internships and also tell us a little bit about where you were. Mm -hmm. So the first internship I uh, did was when I was eighteen years old, and uh, the summer was coming up, and I think I had longer summer because I just finished high school, and I was thinking, what can I do instead of going to regular vacation because it just seemed boring at the time. I was really looking. For forward to doing something more meaningful throughout this time. Uh, so I remember approaching you and asking, what do you think would be a good idea? And we started working, uh, we started talking about World Jewish Relief, which is one of our founders, uh, a charity based in London. And they were great, graceful enough to allow me to come for a month to volunteer there, which was really like the first big world experience for me. Uh, and it really, I think it was the most challenging of all because it was the first time I was doing something so different in a different country, but it was actually really fun and really eye opening. And uh, thanks to this, I think I gained a lot of confidence that maybe this is something that I could do more often and learn from other institutions. So uh, next, the following year, uh, I actually got a chance to work at the Toby Philanthropies in Bay Area. Uh, with Shaina Penn, uh, which was an amazing experience, my first time in the US. And it was also a very exciting time to be there uh, right before the opening of the Pauline, the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. Um, so a lot of work was focused on that and being there to work on it and then coming back to Poland to be at the opening, it was really, really meaningful and fun. Um, and then somehow I gravitated towards New York. <laughs> which uh, I guess it's a great place to be if you want to do some meaningful Jewish nonprofit work. Uh, so in New York, I had two opportunities, one at Park Avenue Synagogue, uh, which is a breathtaking synagogue with their new building, but also just a really wonderful and, and warm community that has visited us very often. And we've developed a very close connection. So that's why I could go there and work with them for a month in all different departments. 
And it was also actually a time when we were uh, opening our uh, early childhood center. So I could visit different childhood, early childhood centers uh, around New York and learn from them. Um, and then uh, the following year, uh, I had an internship, an internship at JC Manhattan. Uh, and there I was uh, vo working in development, but I also worked with the special needs department, which was something that I've never done before. And it was also very meaningful and something very new for me. Uh, but I think throughout this time, what was great for me is that I could experience very different Jewish institutions uh, from all sides of things. So I think that that was really eye-opening, but at the same time, I felt that our little JCC also had something to offer to them in terms of some tips and uh, how we do things. So that was also nice to see. Damn right, damn right we do. And hi, just shout out to Susan friend. Hi, Susan. Um, so you've had some interesting bosses. If I think about the institutions, right? The amazing Joy Levitt, JCC Manhattan Institution, Shana Penn who's just, you know, the smartest person around. Paul Anticoni and what he's done at World Jewish Relief. Even Beryl, who's sometimes <laughs> watching. Beryl. Beryl. Beryl, we love, no, Beryl, we love you, Beryl. Beryl from the from Park Avenue Synagogue. And, and of course, your uh, current boss, so you don't have to talk about me, that's okay. But really, it's, when you look at this, you no, know, but actually, you know, thinking about that, you've had really some, some really pretty spectacular bosses, all stars in the Jewish world. What, what, what have they had in common? Have they had things in common? And if so, what? And what have you been able to take away in terms of that as you've developed your leadership skills? I think something that all of them had in common was how personally I felt uh, in connection with them. Uh, I was, you know, uh, an intern coming from Poland just to work there for some time, but I've developed a very personal connection with each and every one of them. And they were kind of with me throughout the whole process. Uh, so that was really something uh, really, uh, maybe not surprising, like it was a positive surprise that, you know, this kind of great leader in the Jewish world takes time to sit with me from time to time and talk. And I actually still keep in touch uh, with all of them. So I think that was uh, the thing that stood out uh, most for me. And just, it was interesting seeing how they interact with staff and uh, with the members of their institutions, with people that they're helping. It was always very full of warmth and this close personal connection. And I think that's very important. Now, obviously Beryl is uh, number one in all of these, but if you had to rank the rest, no, I'm, I'm I, won't, I won't make you rank. But I think we agree that Beryl was number one. Of course. <laughs> so now, Gish, you at a certain point in terms of your studies, you just finished your studies. Maybe talk a little about it because you changed at a certain point, you changed your studies. So maybe talk about that, what that path was like. You changed your studies and then went on to study something more related to what you're doing. So t tell me about that. So this might actually seem funny to some of the people because I dropped out from Jewish studies out of all the studies that I could drop out. And um, for a long time, I thought this will be my dream studies. Um, and uh, I started working at the JC before I started these studies. So uh, then I realized that actually a lot of this Jewish content about Jewish values and tradition and culture, I get live from the JCC. And as I started working more, I realized that uh, maybe it's better to develop some skills to actually help uh, the nonprofit that I'm in. So I get, I get really interested in the nonprofit world, uh, which in Poland is not, you know, greatly developed. Um, but the, the JCC is really an outshining example of what can be done in a like, successful nonprofit institution. So I went to pursue uh, BA in cultural management of cultural institutions. And then I just grad graduated in my master's in psychology and management. So these were more uh -oh. kind of practical skills. So your BA is in cultural management and then a psychology. So what, what is the, your master's in exactly? Psychology and management. So it's... Hmm. Uh-oh. <laughs> Very good, Gish. As you, soon I'll retire. <laughs> I don't ever imagine that. Me retiring? Yeah. I imagine it every day. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just kidding. 
what about uh, if you weren't doing this, what could you see yourself doing, Gish? I see that this, to me, this is a little bit, I think you're, you're in the category of true believer. And this is, uh, you know, to me, I think many of you see this, or I see this, hopefully, as your life's work. But if you weren't doing this, what would you, this, I don't think when you were, you know, 15 years old, you, this is what you saw yourself doing. What are the other I, paths yeah. for Gish? Gamer. Gamer, for sure. <laughs> but actually, I've heard that like being a test gamer, it's not fun at all because you you play games when they have all these bugs and they don't work and it takes away all the fun. So no, no gaming. What about professional uh, gamer? Maybe professional gamer. Who knows? <laughs> what, game, what game do you like? So recently, I've played Detroit, Becoming Human which is uh, Detroit? This Detroit. I can get you an internship in Detroit if you want to. <laughs> we have a yeah. lot of friends in Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I used to uh, want to become a journalist for some time. Uh, but I think I really found myself in this uh, hands-on uh, environment of doing things. And I think what I like about the ride is that it's uh, it keeps up the pace, it keeps you on your toes, and it's this uh, changing environment that even though we kind of know how to do the ride every year, there are always these moving pieces. So I think if I wasn't working at the JCC, I would find myself some similar work in charity, probably doing some events, uh, ah. but definitely in the nonprofit world. So Rabbi, Rabbi Neil, Neil Zuckerman, our good friend from Park Avenue Synagogue, reminds us that you're a Bruce fan. Yes, I am a Bruce fan. This and is Bob, the boss. <laughs> the boss is the boss. That, that's the, right? When you said, that was, yeah. your, when I said you're supposed to rank the bosses, Geesh, you were supposed to say Bruce is number one, Bruce and then maybe yeah. Beryl number two. <laughs> you have also regards, I see, hi, Bobby. Hi, Bobby. <laughs> hi, Bobby from Philadelphia. Bobby Rothman. And Saul Barua, Barua. Hi, Barua. Hi, Barua. We have the world's, the world's best tour guide watching us. True. Gish, this is different. This has a different, this question has a different meaning for different, different staff members. But how many times a year do I make you cry, Gish? I think none. <laughs> none. Should it be a higher answer? <laughs> No, because sometimes, no, but make you cry in a good way. Ah, in a good way. Well, uh, what way? It could be any way. No, actually, I've uh, shed a tear a few times. Uh, I think one of the most um, t touching times for me was during one of the March of the Living, when you spoke to one of the groups. And somehow, I don't know, it just came to me that there it's March of the Living, we're so close to Auschwitz and all the things we're doing here at the JCC. It kind of made me tear up a little bit. <laughs> Gish, when I speak to a group and you're in the room, my goal, yeah, the group and the group, the group is the group, but I'm thinking, oh, what can I come up with new? You know, she's heard it, she's heard it a thousand times as everybody has in, in, in the building. What can I come up with new to make Gish cry? This is like... <laughs> You know, normally if you just messed up at work, I could yell at you and make you cry that way. But you don't really, I got to say, you don't really do that too often. So there's not, not, not too much of that, not too much of that going on. So I got to try to make you cry, uh, make you cry in a different way. Yeah, definitely happens from time to time. And tell us, because uh, you, you talk a lot about the ride and obviously it's something that was, uh, I guess, whoever had that idea to put you in charge of the ride, pretty good idea. But um, what... What do you see for the ride? How is the ride, how, how can the ride grow? I mean, Corona, Corona, we'll get through this year. It'll look like it'll look. Um, the movie, this feature documentary is coming out, you know, this year about the bicycle ride that, that uh, you know, our friend Melinda Goldrich is, is, uh, is supporting and, 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 and Mark, the amazing, uh, you know, amazing director, uh, Mark is working on that with Lisa, the producer. How is, uh, how do you see, what's the, give us, give us the vision of the ride over the next few years. What, what's going to happen? Uh, well, we'll see what happens when the movie comes out. <laughs> but I think just organically, the way that we've seen, the ride has been growing each year. Um, and I think growing the ride in Krakow is one thing, but something that I really see as an opportunity is kind of this virtual component, something that we had before as in, term, in kind of satellite events 
because the idea of the right it's and the message that it brings it's really universal and uh, it's great that if you can come to Krakow and join us in person but if for some reason you can't we can actually bring this message to you wherever you live and uh, you can do this right virtually with us uh, it's a right from darkness to the light so you can always ride from the holocaust museum in your town to the uh, jewish inst any jewish institution that uh, you're connected with Tra retrace this path in a meaning meaningful way for you uh, so i think having people all around the world to join us in on the same day to do the same thing that we're doing in krakow i think this is really something that will hopefully grow and engage more and more people and communities yeah, I think that, uh, you know, we're talking about there's always limits to some degree of how many people you can put on the road. And especially here in Poland, you're going, you know, from Auschwitz to the JCC, you're going through different jurisdictions and different municipalities and police departments. And it gets very complicated with the logistics. But to be honest, as we've seen the world now switch to an online world, that this idea of doing a virtual ride and having people ride along with us from their own houses, which I guess will uh, have some degree to test out a little bit this year, and then that could be the way the way that we grow moving forward. Yeah, I definitely think so. And I really see this as this surprising opportunity that came up in this really difficult year for us. But I think this is something that gives us all excitement and hope for this year. Well, that's a very, very, on that very optimistic note, uh, Agnieszka Gish, I'm going to thank you. From, you. from all our viewers and thank you also for me personally as coming to work every day and working with you has been an absolute joy and I wish that uh, you know if, if, if other organizations if people had you know people like you and them is, is, is just you know makes the world a lot better and to see you know all teasing you aside and, and everything I always find that I try to throw as much at you as possible and I've always done that because there's never anything that I've thrown at you that you haven't been able to handle. And it's really, you've been somebody, it's been amazing to watch you, watch you from a, you know, to grow from a 16 year old to, uh, to, you know, to the amazing young woman you are now. And uh, to all that you do for the Jewish world and for this institution, you know, as somebody not Jewish who really just cares, I think that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're really a, an inspiration to many of us. Thank you. I really it appreciate it. It doesn't mean that you get a raise or anything, but you're still an <laughs> Just more work, like we talked in the beginning. Since you said how happy you are to get more work, uh, instead of a raise, you'll get more and more work. <laughs> Perfect. All right, Agnieszka, thank you. Next week, thank see you. everybody. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to also leave you. Uh, stay safe, everybody. Maintain the social distancing. Let's try to keep ourselves in a good way mentally and physically. Make sure you're getting some exercise. Eat healthy. And let's, uh, at this time when the world is going through difficult stuff, let's try to do what we can for others and understand that the only way we'll get through this is being there for one another. So thank you. Thank you. Be well.